Anticoagulation Principles, DOAX, Part 1, Background, Mechanism, and Use. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to another installment of the Farm Easy Tutor. After completing previous videos covering warfarin and heparin, we move on with today's discussion that will finish our journey talking about anticoagulants. Today, we will begin a three-part series going over the direct-acting oral anticoagulants, commonly known as the DOACs. In part one of the DOACs, we will discuss their background, mechanism of action, and uses. I hope you'll enjoy this presentation. The arrival of direct-acting oral anticoagulants, the DOACs, a class of oral anticoagulants first introduced in the U.S. market in 2010, has transformed the field of anticoagulation. DOACs are categorized into two main classes based on their mechanism. The first mechanism are the oral direct factor 10A inhibitors. Drugs in this class include apixaban, aliquis, rivaroxaban, xeralto, and idoxaban, saveza. The second class are the direct thrombin inhibitors. One drug in this class is dabigatran, or Pradaxa. Dabigatran was the first DOAC approved by the FDA in 2010. It was the first oral anticoagulant approved in the U.S. since warfarin's approval in 1954. Dabigatran's approval was followed by the approval of rivaroxaban in 2011, apixaban in 2012, and adoxaban in 2015. Over the past few years, DOACs have quickly gained popularity as safe and effective oral anticoagulants and have surpassed warfarin as preferred agents for several clinical indications. This is because DOACs are more convenient and simpler to use than warfarin. DOACs are simpler to dose, require less rigorous monitoring, less frequent drawing of labs, and own fewer drug-drug and drug-food interactions than warfarin. Also, DOACs have a faster onset of effect and, if needed, a quicker offset of effect, that is, if needed for a procedure. Let's talk about some advantages of using DOACs. Advantages of DOACs compared to warfarin include more convenient, easy-to-prescribe fixed dosages, fewer monitoring requirements with less frequent lab testing and follow-up, much more predictable pharmacokinetics, doesn't require dose titration to stay within a narrow therapeutic range, more rapid drug onset and offset effects, and fewer drug-drug and drug-food interactions. Some disadvantages of using DOAX compared to warfarin include higher cost, strict adherence needed to avoid missed dosages due to short half-lives, avoidance or dose reduction in renal impairment, and it may need to be taken two times a day. Clinical guidelines now favor DOAX over warfarin and other therapies as the preferred anticoagulant for stroke prevention in non-valvular atrial fibrillation, NVAF, and for the treatment and prevention of VTE. DOACs are also indicated for VTE prophylaxis following knee or hip surgery and in medically ill patients, and have also been used as adjunctive treatment to prevent cardiovascular events in patients with coronary or peripheral artery disease, CAD, PAD. DOACs now represent over 85% of new prescriptions for oral anticoagulant therapy as they have largely replaced warfarin. Analyses have shown that apixaban has become the most prescribed DOAC for non-valvular atrial fibrillation and accounted for approximately half of new DOAC prescriptions by 2017. But don't forget, DOACs can be dangerous. With such straightforward prescribing of DOACs and less intensive dose management than warfarin, it's easy to forget that these powerful anticoagulants carry a risk of severe bleeding and other serious complications. Anticoagulants have consistently ranked as the class of medications most frequently leading to emergency room visits and hospital admissions for adverse drug events. National surveillance data 
showed that the number of ADE reports for anticoagulants as a class, DOAX and warfarin, increased by more than fourfold from 1,576 in 2005 to 7,211 in 2013. Between 2013 and 2014, the DOAX, rivaroxaban, and dabigatran were the fifth and tenth most common drugs respectively to cause emergency room visits for ADEs in older adults. This video's discussion will focus primarily on the more commonly prescribed DOAX, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and dabigatran. The content will exclude edoxaban. As a side note, another DOAC, Betrixaban or Bevixa, approved in 2017, was primarily indicated for prevention of DVT. It was discontinued in April of 2020. An excellent reference to use when learning about DOACs is the DOAC Playbook, published by the Anticoagulation Forum. It can be accessed online at the link on screen. I will also provide this link at the bottom in the comments section. It is a good resource to have available. As we stated earlier, there are two direct factor 10A inhibitor DOACs. Apixaban or Eliquis, made by Bristol-Myers Squibb Pfizer, and Rivaroxaban, Sorelto, made by Janssen. There's one direct thrombin inhibitor DOAC, Dabigatran, Prodaxa, made by Boringo Ingelheim. As we learned in earlier videos, warfarin interferes with the synthesis of active vitamin K-dependent clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. In contrast, DOACs directly neutralize a specific clotting factor, factor 10A or 2A. Thrombin is a cofactor that enables the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin which is the final step to thrombus formation in the coagulation cascade. When the activity of thrombin is inhibited, such as with the bigotran, the development of the thrombus is prevented. The oral factor 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban, work further upstream in the coagulation cascade. Factor 10A is also involved in the production of thrombin itself, so inhibiting factor 10A will directly decrease the production of thrombin. Here are the FDA-approved indications for the DOAX. The first indication is for non-valvular atrial fibrillation to reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolism. All three DOAX are approved for this use. The next two indications are for VTE acute treatment, DVT or PE, and for VTE secondary prevention to reduce the risk of recurrence of VTE. Again, all three DOACs are approved for, this, for these uses. The next use is for VTE prophylaxis in total hip replacement and total knee replacement. All three DOACs are approved for this indication with the exception of the Bigatran, which is approved only for hip replacement. Rivaroxaban is the only DOAC that is indicated for the next two uses, for VTE prophylaxis in acutely ill medical patients and for the reduction of risk of major cardiovascular events in chronic CAD or PAD. The DOACs have two pediatric indications, treatment of VTE and reduction in the risk of recurrent VTE in pediatric patients only rivaroxaban and the bigotran are indicated for this use. The second pediatric indication is for thromboprophylaxis in pediatric patients two years and older with congenital heart disease after the Fontan procedure. Only rivaroxaban is indicated for this use. Apixaban has several uses that are off-label that is not yet officially FDA approved but may be currently tried in clinical practice treatment of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, prevention and treatment of cancer-associated DVT, prevention of thromboembolism after PCI with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, and prevention of thromboembolism in hospitalized acutely ill medical patients.
Let's compare and contrast the various dosages of the DOAX used for each specific indication. For non-valvular atrial fibrillation to reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolism, the dose for apixaban is 5 mg BID. The dose should be reduced to 2.5 mg BID if two or more of the following apply to the patient, age greater than or equal to 80 years, weight less than or equal to 60 kilograms, or the serocreatinine is greater than or equal to 1.5. Usage when the creatinine clearance is less than 15 is based on pharmacokinetics and not on clinical studies. Caution is advised. The dose for rivaroxaban is 20 milligrams daily with the evening meal. If the creatinine clearance is less than or equal to 50, the dose should be reduced to 15 milligrams daily with the evening meal. And if the creatinine clearance is less than 15, avoid use. The dose for dabigatran is 150 milligrams BID. If the creatinine clearance is between 15 and 30, the dose should be reduced to 75 milligrams BID. And if the creatinine clearance is less than 15, the use of dabigatran is not recommended. For the acute treatment of VTE, DVT, or PE, the dose of apixaban is 10 mg BID for 7 days, then 5 mg BID. No dose adjustment based on renal function is needed. Usage of creatinine clearance is less than 15 is based on pharmacokinetics and not on clinical studies. Caution is advised. The dose for rivaroxaban is 15 mg BID for 21 days, then 20 mg daily with food. If the creatinine clearance is less than 15, avoid the use of rivaroxaban. For dabigatran, for VTE treatment, an initial 5 to 10 days of parenteral anticoagulation, low molecular weight heparin, is required before initiating dabigatran. The dose is 150 mg BID. If the creatinine clearance is less than or equal to 30, the use of dabigatran is not recommended. For VTE secondary prevention to reduce the risk of recurrence of VTE, the dose of apixaban is 2.5 mg BID. If the creatinine clearance is less than 15, there are no clinical studies. For rivaroxaban, the dose is 10 mg daily with or without food. If the creatinine clearance is less than 15, avoid use. And for dabigatran, 150 mg BID after previous initial treatment. If the creatinine clearance is less than or equal to 30, the use of dabigatran is not recommended. For VTE prophylaxis in total hip replacement and total knee replacement, for pixaban, treatment should be started 12 to 24 hours postoperatively. The dose is 2.5 mg BID for 35 days for the hip replacement and 12 days for knee replacement. For rivaroxaban, treatment should start 6 to 10 hours postoperatively. The dose is 10 mg daily for 35 days for the hip replacement and 12 days for knee replacement. For dabigatran, VTE prophylaxis is only indicated in total hip replacement. 110 milligrams for the first day, then 220 milligrams daily for 28 to 35 days. Again, VT prophylaxis in total knee replacement is not approved. As before, doses should be adjusted for renal insufficiency. For VTE prophylaxis in acutely ill medical patients, the rivaroxaban dose is 10 milligrams daily in hospital and after discharge for a total of 31 to 39 days. For the indication to reduce the risk of major cardiovascular events in chronic CAD or PAD, the rivaroxaban dose is 2.5 mg BID with or without food, with aspirin 75 to 100 mg daily. For the pediatric indications, I refer you to the prescribing information to provide you with more detailed dosing tables. When talking about doses of DOAX, we find that inappropriate DOAX dosing is very common. Recent evidence have demonstrated that up to 32% of patients experience inappropriate DOAX dosing. 
inappropriate dosing of DOEX can increase the risk of developing a stroke due to subtherapeutic dosing or serious bleeding complications caused by supertherapeutic doses. As all of the DOEX rely on renal elimination of unchanged drug, the most common reason for inappropriate dosing from FDA-approved doses is changing renal function. Most frequently, overdoses occur as a result of not adjusting the DOAC dose for renal insufficiency. Therefore, it is critical for physicians and pharmacists to periodically monitor renal function in patients taking DOACs to ensure that it remains stable. Dosage form information. Apixaban is available as 2.5 and 5 milligram tablets. Rivaroxaban is available as 2.5, 10, 15, and 20 milligram tablets and is also available as an oral suspension. The Bigatran is available as 75, 110, and 150 milligram capsules. It's important to remember to close the bottle for the Bigatran immediately after use and keep it tightly closed. Keep the dibigatran in the original container, remove only at the time of use. Do not put dibigatran in pill boxes or medication organizers. Once the bottle is open, the product must be used within four months. Due to differences in bioavailability, do not use two 75 milligram capsules for a 150 milligram dose. Are we able to crush these medications? For apixaban and rivaroxaban, the answer is yes. The tablets may be crushed and suspended in water or may be mixed with applesauce or apple juice. For dibigatran, the answer is no. Do not chew, break, or open the capsules. Bioavailability increases dangerously by 75% if the capsule is opened. Here's the information on missed doses. For missed doses, they should be taken as soon as possible on the same day, but not doubled up to make up for a missed dose. To summarize, in part one, we listed four advantages and four disadvantages of using DOAX compared to warfarin. We reviewed the two different mechanisms of action of the DOAX. We listed four indications that are common to the three main DOACs. We defined when dosages should be decreased for declining renal function for the three main DOACs. And we described the limitations of storing and opening the Bigatran capsules. Coming up next in part two of this series on the DOACs, we will compare and contrast the absorption, metabolism, and renal excretion of the three main DOACs outline the key drug-drug interactions that DOAX are involved with, review the major warnings, precautions, and adverse effects of using DOAX, and describe how to switch DOAX to another anticoagulant and vice versa. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.